Dolichlawen, na Dolichlawen, which is of course Welsh for Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, yes. Well, no, I mean, it, what's written down on the page is Welsh. The way right. I said it may not be Welsh for Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I have a good friend who's a, a, a real b- brilliant comic advocate for the Welsh language, and he will want to kill me now, but there we are. And talking of that, you catching up on Gavin and Stacey? Um, I haven't seen it yet. It's on the Sky Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Central Christmas viewing in the Holland household, I have to say. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, yeah, so today... What have you got, I, what yeah, have you got for I, I am reading The Unwomanly Face of War by Svetlana Aleksevich. Um, and this is... I, I think this is really fascinating. I came across this book because, um, as we've already discussed, for next year's Chalk Valley History Festival, mm. we have got a T-34 tank. Yes. And we are training up an all-female crew. <sighs> because... They really existed. Yeah. Um, and um, what's brilliant about the unwomanly face of war is this is um, Svetlana Alexevich has gone and interviewed lots and lots and lots of female veterans mm. of the Eastern Front who yeah. had fought in the Red Army, and they fought as combatants. Yeah. And they were snipers, and they were infantry women, and they were tank night crews, witches and, and, and they were night yeah. witches. And, and what she does is she just records them and then publishes huge extracts huge tracks yeah. of these voices. So what I'm going to be doing is is reading a number of these female Red Army combatants and their thoughts on the war and what happened to them. So what Svetlana Alexevich does in The Unwomanly Face of War so brilliantly is she doesn't try and put words into anyone's mouth. She doesn't paraphrase. She just writes out what she was told. So I'm going to read a few extracts from three different female Red Army competents. And the first one, and I'm going to have to try and pronounce this, is Alexandra Semyonovna Popova. And she's a lieutenant of the guards and a pilot. Our regiment was all women. We flew to the front in May 1942. The planes they gave us were PO2s, small, slow, They flew only at a low level, hedgehopping, just over the ground. Before the war, young people in flying clubs learned to fly in them, but no one could have imagined they would have had any military use. The plane was constructed entirely of plywood, covered with aircraft fabric, in fact, with cheesecloth. One direct hit, and it caught fire and burned up completely in the air before reaching the ground, like a match. The only solid metal part was the M11 motor. Later on, towards the end of the war, we were issued parachutes and a machine gun was installed in the pilot's cabin. But before, there had been no weapon, except for four bomb racks under the wings. That's all. Nowadays, they call us kamikazes, and maybe we were kamikazes. Yes, we were. But victory was valued more than our lives. Victory. You ask how we could endure it. I'll tell you. Before I retired, I became ill from the very thought of how I could possibly not work. Why then had I completed a second degree in my fifties? I became a historian. I had been a geologist all my life. But a good geologist is always in the field, and I no longer had the strength for it. A doctor came, took a cardiogram, and asked, When did you have a heart attack? What heart attack? Your heart is scarred all over. I must have acquired those scars during the war. You approach a target. You're shaking all over. Your whole body is shaking, because below it's all gunfire. Fighter planes are shooting. Anti-aircraft guns are shooting. Several girls had to leave the regiment. They couldn't stand it. We flew mostly during the night. For a while they tried sending us on day missions, but gave it up at once. A rifle shot could bring down a PO2. We did up to 12 flights a night. I saw the famous ace, Pok Rishkin, when he returned from a fighting mission. He was a sturdy man, not 20 and not 23 like us. But while his plane was refuelled, a technician took his shirt off and wrung it out. It was soaked as if he had been in the rain. So now you can easily imagine what it was like for us. You come back and you can't even get out of the cabin. They used to pull us out. We couldn't carry the chart case. We dragged it on the ground. And the work our girl armourers did. They had to attach four bombs to the aircraft by hand. That meant 800 pounds. They did it all night. One plane takes off, another lands. The body reorganised itself so much during the war that we weren't women. We didn't have those women's things. Periods, you know. And after the war, not all of us could have children. 
We all smoked. I also smoked. It made you feel as if you'd calmed down a little. You come back to earth, shaking all over. You light a cigarette and you calm down. We wore leather jackets, trousers, army shirts, plus a fur jacket in winter. Like it or not, something masculine appeared in your gait and your movements. When the war was over, they made us khaki-coloured dresses. We suddenly felt we were young girls. So that was the first extract. And the second one is by Sofia Adamovna Kuncevich. And she's a sergeant major, medical assistant in an infantry company. They gave me a medal recently from the Red Cross, the Florence Nightingale International Gold Medal. Everybody congratulates me and wonders, how could you drag out 147 wounded men? You're such a diminutive girl in the wartime photos. Well, maybe I dragged out 200. Nobody was counting them. It never entered my head. We didn't understand it that way. A battle was going on. People were losing blood. So should I sit and take notes? I never waited for the attack to be over. I crawled around during the combat, picking up the wounded. If a man had a shrapnel wound and I arrived an hour or two later, there would have been nothing for me to do. The man would have lost all his blood. I was wounded three times and had a concussion three times. People dreamed of all sorts of things during the war. One of going back home, another of getting to Berlin. I wished for just one thing, to live until my birthday, so as to turn 18. For some reason, I was afraid to die without having lived at least 18 years. I used to wear trousers, a forage cap, and I was always in tatters because I was always crawling on my knees and under the weight of the wounded man. It was hard to believe that a day would come when I would be able to get up and walk, not crawl on the ground. That was my dream. One day a division commander arrived, saw me and asked, Who is this adolescent boy? Why do you keep him here? He should be sent to school. I remember when there weren't enough bandages. There were such terrible bullet wounds that each needed a whole package. I tore up all my underwear and I told the boys, Take off your long johns, your undershirts. I've got people dying here. They took everything off, tore it up. I wasn't embarrassed in front of them. They were like brothers to me, and I lived among them like a boy. We were marched by three holding hands, and the middle one could sleep for an hour or two. Then we'd change places. I got as far as Berlin. I put my signature on the Reichstag. I, Sofia Kuncevich, came here to kill war. When I see a common grave, I kneel before it. Before every common grave. Always on my knees. So this third one is a partisan. Uh, and she's called Raisa Grigorievna Kosinovich. They began to bomb Minsk. I rushed to the kindergarten to get my son. My daughter was out of town. she just turned two. She was at the day nursery and they went out of town. I decided to pick up my son and bring him home and then run for her. I wanted to gather them all quickly. I reached the kindergarten. Planes were flying over the city, bombing somewhere. I heard my son's voice over the fence. He was not quite four years old. Don't worry. My mother says the Germans will be crushed. I looked through the gate. There were many of them there and he was reassuring the others like that. But when he saw me, he began to tremble and cry. It turned out that he was terrified. I brought him home, asked my mother-in-law to look after him, and went to get my daughter. I ran. I found no one where the nursery was supposed to be. The village women told me the children had been taken somewhere. Where? Who? Probably to the city, they said. There were two teachers with them. They didn't wait for the car and left on foot. The city was seven miles away. But they were such little children, from one to two years old. My dear, I looked for them for two weeks in many villages. When I entered a house and they told me it was that very nursery, those kids, I didn't believe them. They were lying, forgive me, in their own excrement, feverish, as if dead. The director of the nursery was a very young woman. Her hair had turned grey. It turned out that they had walked all the way to the city, got lost on the way. Several children had died. I walked among them and didn't recognise my daughter. The director comforted me. Don't despair. Look around. She must be here. I remember her. I found my Aleshka only thanks to her shoes. Otherwise, I would never have recognised her. Then our house burned down. We were left on the street, in what we had on. German units had already entered the city. We had nowhere to go. I walked around the streets with my children for several days. I met Tamara, Sergeyevna, Sinitsa. We had been slight acquaintances before the war. She heard me and said, Let's go to my place. My children are sick with whooping cough, I told her. How can I go with you? She also had little children. They might get infected. That's how it was then. There were no medications. Hospitals no longer worked. No, let's go. 
My dear, how could I ever forget it? They shared potato peelings with us. I sewed pants out of my old skirt for my son to give him something for his birthday. But we dreamed of fighting. Inactivity tormented us. What a joy it was when the opportunity came to join the underground workforce and not sit around with folded arms waiting. Just in case, I sent off my son, the older boy, to my mother-in-law. She made one condition. I'll take my grandson, but you should no longer be seen in the house. We'll all get killed on account of you. For three years, I didn't see my son. I was afraid to go near the house, and when the Germans already had an eye on me and picked up my trail, I took my daughter, and we both went to the partisans. I carried her for 30 miles. 30 miles? We walked for two weeks. She stayed there with me for over a year. I often think, how do we survive that? If you asked me, I couldn't tell you. My dear, such things are impossible to endure. Even today, my teeth chatter at the words, partisan blockade. May 1943. I was sent off with a typewriter to the neighbouring partisan zone. Borisovskaya. They had our typewriter with Russian characters, but they needed one with German characters, and we were the only ones to have such a typewriter. This was the typewriter I'd carried out of the occupied Minsk, following the underground committee's orders. When I got there, to Lake Palak, after a few days the blockade began. That's where I ended up. I didn't come alone, I came with my daughter. When I went on a mission for a day or two, I left her with other people. But there was nowhere to leave her for long periods. So, of course, I took my child with me. And we got caught in the blockade. The Germans encircled the partisan zone. They bombed us from the sky and shot us from the ground. The men went around carrying rifles, but I carried a rifle, the typewriter, and a lochka. As we walked, I tripped. She fell over me into a swamp. We went on, she fell again, and so on, for two months. I swore to myself, if I survived, I wouldn't go near that swamp again. I couldn't look at it any more. I know why you don't lie down when they shoot. You want us both to get killed. That's what my four-year-old child would say to me but I didn't have the strength to lie down. If I did, I'd never get up again. Other times the partisans felt sorry for me. Enough, let us carry your daughter. But I didn't trust anyone. What if they start shelling? What if she gets killed without me and I don't hear it? What if she gets lost? I met the brigade commander, Le Patin. Oh, the woman! He was amazed. In those circumstances, she carried a child and didn't let go of the typewriter. Not every man could do that. He took a lochka in his arms, hugged her, kissed her. He emptied out all his pockets, gave her breadcrumbs. She downed them with water from the swamp. And following his example, other partisans emptied their pockets and gave her crumbs. When we got out of the encirclement, I was completely sick. I was covered with boils, my skin was peeling off, and I had a child on my hands. We were waiting for a plane from the mainland. They said that if it came, they would send off the most badly wounded, and they could take my lochka. And I remember that moment when I was sending her away. The wounded reached out for her. Alochka, to me. Come to me, there's enough room. They all knew her. In the hospital, she sang for them. Ah, if only I lived till my wedding bells. The pilot asked, Who are you here with, little girl? With Mama. She stayed outside the cabin. Call your Mama, so she can fly with you. No, my Mama can't leave. She has to fight the fascists. That's how they were, our children. And I looked at her face and had spasms. Will I see her again some day? Let me tell you how my son and I were reunited. This was already after the liberation. I was walking to the house where my mother-in-law lived. My legs were like cotton wool. The women from the brigade, they were older, warned me. If you see him, no matter what, don't reveal to him straight away that you're his mother. Do you realise what he's lived through without you? A neighbour girl runs by. Oh, Lenya's mother! Lenya's alive! My legs won't go any further. My son is alive. She told me that my mother-in-law had died of typhus and a neighbour woman had taken Lenya in. I walked into their yard. What was I wearing? A German army shirt, a patched-up black padded jacket, and old boots. The neighbour immediately recognised me, but she said nothing, and my son sits there, barefoot, ragged. What's your name, boy? I ask. Lenya. And who do you live with? I used to live with my grandmother. When she died, I buried her. I came to her every day and asked her to take me to her grave. I was afraid to sleep alone. Where are your mama and papa? My papa's alive, he's at the front. But mamma was killed by the fascists, so my grandmother said. Two partisans were with me. They had come to bury their comrades. They listened to how he was answering, and wept. I couldn't stand it any longer. Why don't you recognise your mamma? He rushed to me. 
Papa! I was wearing men's clothes and a hat. Then he hugged me and screamed, Mama! It was such a scream, such hysterics. For a month he didn't let me go anywhere, not even to work. I took him with me. It wasn't enough for him to see me, to see I was nearby. He had to hold on to me. If we sat down for lunch, he had held me with one hand and ate with the other. He only called me Mamochka. He still does. Mamochka. Mamolenka. When we were reunited with my husband, a week wasn't enough to tell everything. We talked day and night. I'm a huge fan of this author, by the way. Um, she read, there's a book she did about Chernobyl. Um, yes. Uh, there's one about um, uh, Boys in Zinc, about yep. um, Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. She um, also did one about children in the war. Yeah, children in the war. And uh, what she sort of did, or, uh, or, or was in particular, was document people's experience of the Soviet system mm. without ever saying to them, tell us how terrible the Soviet system was, please. She 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 got people to articulate how they were f- feeling, what they were saying. And I think I think the book about Afghanistan got into real hot water um, because because it basically was telling the truth about a thing that was that was c- completely covered up. Yep. Um, and the boys in zinc, that refers to the zinc coffins people were sent home in. Yeah, yeah. And the Soviet state the, the, in the 80s would, was trying to um, hide the fact that um, there were suffering casualties there. So you'd have your son delivered to you in the middle of the night so it didn't attract attention. So, of course, it, deli- it attracted complete attention because people were living those great big, Khrushchev blocks of flats and they'd bring a coffin up in the lift or if the lift didn't work up the stairs to your place lots on the, of noise lots of clanging on the 25th floor and yep. everyone would know what had happened yeah but her books do that very dispassionate yep this is what happened to me but, but doing, by doing it dispassionate you just you it, it's just so much more affecting yeah and, and you know these passages are they're just so interesting and the women involved you know they, they talk about every aspect of it about the actual fighting about yep. being wounded about what it's like being a girl having to wear you know trousers and boots and get into a tank and and you know what they think of the blokes yeah. and and sexual harassment and yeah. a whole host of things i mean he's just so interesting yeah brilliant books well, happy new year yeah happy new year everyone <laughs>